First speaker. <clears throat> We have from, from Holland, we have Jeroen van den Hoven, who is a professor of ethics and technology at Delft University. He has uh, done a lot. That his CV is in your little booklet. I'm just going to mention the best part from this year. This year, in 2018, he has published uh, a renowned article, Will Democracy Survive Big Data and Artificial Intelligence? And he has also co-authored a book called Evil Online. And this is his latest achievements, and that's just a little of his CV. I'll give you the word, Mr. Van den Hoven. You have 13 minutes, not more. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Well, how to win the elections in the 21st century? Um, I have to say I'm, a, I'm fairly pessimistic uh, when you look at the most promising answers to that question. And this is the reason why a number of concerned colleagues uh, in Europe and I wrote this paper in the Scientific American and we had already uh, previously uh, written it up in, in German, but we thought it was very important to, to reach out to the largest possible audience because we think this is a global phenomenon that needs to be addressed uh, on a global uh, scale. And recently, uh, my colleagues in Delft, um, uh, on, uh, um, um, commissioned by the, uh, the Dutch government, looked into the manipulation of voters during the local elections in the Netherlands early in this uh, year in spring. Uh, and what I will be saying will be drawing upon the, the work in this Scientific American uh, uh, paper on will democracy survive big data and artificial intelligence and on this more recent study into the manipulation of voters during the local elections in the Netherlands. But on both counts, I think the, the picture is pretty clear by now. And those who are willing and capable to invest in social media strategies, engage in micro-targeting and psychological profiling and psychography, nudging, machine learning, those willing to mobilize, botnets, uh, launch large volumes of uh, fake Facebook and Twitter accounts, sending AI-powered messages while using big data uh, and using A-B testing, and those deploying recommender systems, managing YouTube channel channels, those people can achieve a lot politically. And there is now, I think, a self-reinforcing Bermuda Triangle uh, in place that consists of, first, advanced behavioral science, choice modeling, cognitive biases, nudging, secondly, machine learning, and third, big data. And it devours human autonomy and self-determination. And what is even worse, it is for sale, as the Cambridge Analytica case has demonstrated. New investigations uh, of foreign money streams and manipulative practices associated with Brexit campaign in the UK are now under new investigation. The return on investment of learning about the probabilities of winners and losers uh, in elections and referenda can be high. But being in a position to determine the outcomes of these processes with near certainty is, of course, priceless. Political investors can exploit the fact that we have introduced vulnerabilities into Western liberal democracies by naively assuming over the last three decades that the invisible digital hand would by itself produce a good and democratic digital society. And this turns out to have been a fatal mistake. This is, I believe, the motor of our contemporary epistemic crisis, the crisis of a jeopardized pursuit of truth. Our former truth-tracking institutions are no longer fully truth-oriented. Merchants of doubt have tainted signs with anomalies and statistics. Influencers and meddlers have compromised independent journalism with fake news propaganda, disinformation, and false hyper-partisan narratives and lobbyists have undermined trust in politics. Profit-maximizing managing elites have obliterated trust in the financial sector and corporate world, and digital technologies have given a help and helping hand to all of these. The top legal advisor of the European Commission, Paul Nemitz, discusses the enormous concentration of power with big tech in, recent, in a recent publication, and he draws attention to a very unfavorable constellation that threatens our open liberal democracies. The accumulation of capital, ownership of ubiquitous and central digital infrastructures and online platforms, the domination of public discourse and journalism, the control over persons and their data, and finally monopolies in AI, science, technology, and innovation. In order to protect and strengthen Western liberal democracies in the age of AI, he argues, we need a new culture of technology and business development, which we call human rights, rule of law, and democracy by design. And I will come back to that in the end. Trust in the institutions of liberal democracies in decline all over the world while independent media, freedom of expression, and alternative sources of information are among the democratic parameters that have shown the greatest global decline in recent years. 
Some countries in Europe have successfully offered resistance to these trends while at the same time adopting uh, new digital technologies. In the Netherlands, for example, trust in the media is very high, citizen concern regarding disinformation low, and the percentage of citizens that have reported to come into contact with disinformation only 10 percent. So what are the main threats? The first potential threat uh, concerns the rise of political micro-targeting, as has been mentioned by the previous speakers which allows political actors to target individual citizens directly in their online browsing so that every user gets a different, specifically tailored ad advertisement to see. This tailored advertising model comes with the digital economy and the features of the current online platform environment. But it is potentially disastrous for democratic politics when political advisements remain in the dark or are unknowable to anyone except the sender, receiver, and the platform. At that point, customized political advertisements erode the public dimension of democratic politics. The second problem is that the rise of a new online public space can be harmful when the old shared public space is left vacant and when it leads to further filter bubbles, divisions and balkanization. It gives a completely new dimension or meaning to the structural change of the public sphere that Habermas talked about decades ago. And a third harm can come from disinformation, which is intentionally misleading information provided for political purposes and gain. And the fourth related harm might come from algorithmic distortion, where the selection of content by algorithms online might enhance political filter bubbles and echo chambers. Our study of manipulation of voters online during the local elections in the Netherlands shows that political micro-targeting is both possible and probable, even in the Dutch parliamentary system. On the basis of surveying trackers on Dutch political news sites, personal political blogs and websites of all major political parties, we found Google and Facebook trackers most present, together with a host of relatively small data analytic companies that provide personal and categorical advertising capabilities. Some firms also provide tailored big data political micro-targeting capabilities, and all of them seem to use them, political parties that is. And while we find that political parties do not themselves engage in large-scale micro-targeting through the use of trackers on their website, all parties admitted to making use of Facebook's micro-targeting plat platform for political campaigns. While many accounts on Twitter are controlled by human users, many others are partially or highly automated bots. The botometer uh, API that we used uh, provides estimates of the likelihood of automation for each account in our data set. And we found that the right-wing party of Geert Wilders, the PVV, well known, benefited most from engagement by accounts that were deleted immediately after the election, which is evidence of bot activity, and that other right-wing parties also benefited more from such engagement than other parties. Accounts associated with the far-right party of Wilders had the most interactions with all echo chambers we identified. And this seems to suggest that Wilders supporters determine large parts of the narrative on Twitter, employing a hegemonic discourse. Targeting the, these discourses affiliated with populist right, far-right wing parties would therefore make a lot of sense from a strategic point of view for Russian trawlers when seeking to influence uh, the discourse. When searching for Dutch political content on YouTube, one is three times more likely to encounter populist far-right content, we found, than that of any other political ideology. Um, we also showed that this is operative in, in YouTube. The digital in environment uh, thus did de delegitimize the Dutch elections in the sense that the use of intransparent and potentially illegal micro-targeting was used by all parties. There is also a strong rise in intermediary companies and trackers, which means that there is an increasing power of the corporate actors in the public, in public domain and public affairs. The conservative right-wing discourse that was hegemonic online, moreover, proved particularly vulnerable to potential disinformation through bot engagement. This is in line with findings of Jochai Benkler in his recent book, Network Propaganda and Radicalization in American politics. I recommend you to read that. Um, what can be said, I think, globally is, is that in the age of ubiquitous digital technologies, our values, ideals, and principles need to be designed for. One could even argue that talking about responsibility, privacy, autonomy, safety, security, without providing ideas about anchoring it in, digital, in the digital world is gratuitous. 
If we do not think about design ourselves in a transparent and accountable way, others will do it in self-serving ways, surreptitiously. According to the American pragmatist philosopher John Dewey, we have to reinvent democracy every day anew, and now, in addition, we have to design for it every day anew. And if we cannot technically implement our democratic ideals and ideas and design against undemocratic tendencies, we risk losing them altogether. Fortunately, there are many experiments underway with, with design for diversity, design for participation, design for inclusion, and design software that breaks filter bubbles. Although one needs to proceed carefully there, because recent studies have demonstrated that these attempts to open filter bubbles may sometimes have the opposite effect and lead to polarization instead of reconciliation. An interesting fundamental design attempt along these lines is Tim Berners-Lee's plan for self-sovereign identity management infrastructure, which will be, I think, hugely important for the future of privacy and data protection. Experiments with forms of deliberative platforms are also underway. My University, Delft, is building massive open online deliberation platforms, MOODs, instead of MOOCs. We have experimented in Rotterdam in the Netherlands with limited functionality supporting thousand citizens involved in a one-day deliberation with the mayor in attendance about issues on the political agenda in the city, the country, Europe and the world. I think the European Commission and the European Parliament urgently need to embark upon a large pan-European design for online democracy initiative before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. van der Hoeven. I, I, was, I was waiting for very long for a positive ending because it was such a gloomy presentation. I thought we're all doomed. We can just, you know, the European elections next year are going to be... <laughs> the, uh, is, our, is our only hope. So, and, and, and there's quite good evidence that we can do a lot there, you know. So, um, so thinking about these democracy platforms, if we would, what if we would have a Wikipedia not for facts but for opinions? That's a very reliable, open environment. Uh, it's come a long way. It's, it's actually gained a lot in, in reliability and in, in, in quality. Mm -hmm. uh, if we would have a platform like that where people could come together uh, and discuss the things that matter from a political point of view and from a moral point of view, I think that is, first of all, a scientific endeavor of, of large importance, but it's also a civic uh, mm -hmm. endeavor of, of large importance. And I, I, I think we need to go there and occupy that space. Hi, Erwin Lima uh, with Frank Watching from the Netherlands. Uh, I have two questions actually for uh, Professor van den Hoven, if that's all right. Um, the first question uh, kind of speaks to, um, uh, I write for a more marketing, business and technology um, uh, audience. And um, we're, we've been talking a lot, and you yourself uh, spoke of uh, these uh, sort of advanced uh, pieces of knowledge and technology that are being used to sway people in uh, the, the pol political area, uh, talking about uh, AI, micro-targeting, and, and uh, all these, these things that, that David also touched upon. Um, sorry, long introduction. My question, do you, uh, do you feel that there is um, a responsibility for uh, marketers, entrepreneurs, people who are actually helping to create and sustain this uh, sort of advertising ecosystem that, that, that makes all of this possible? And if so, what is that responsibility in your view? That's my first question. Take your second as well. My second as well? That's a, that's, that's a very pertinent, very relevant question. Um, uh, as, as with respect to some of the other ethical issues that were touched upon, I think this is something that is in, in process, like we had to think about policies and rules about where to place a poster, whether that could be very close to the voting uh, building where people <coughs> cast their vote or whether it could be inside or it could be just 100 meters away. We, you know, the ethical uh, problems need to be solved at a fairly detailed level. So we have to think about what are the rules that we need to put in place to protect people from in this spectrum between, and, and it was referred to by also by the previous speakers, somewhere um, convincing and service, ser serving people kind of flips into manipulation and brainwashing, let's say. So, so we need to think about where does that happen. 
Um, that also, for example, we saw that in, in questions to do in the criminal justice area about entrapment. So you put a, uh, a bait somewhere for, for criminals to, you know, to, to act upon, but sometimes it becomes uh, so obvious that everyone would almost kind of uh, be tricked into doing something that is, that is not allowed, that it becomes unfair. So the same thing here. So we have to think about these things. Um, I am worried, and your, your question speaks to that, I'm very much worried about the build-up of knowledge that is, um, uh, of a knowledge ecosystem that is so asymmetrical that voters, citizens, consumers, patients are sitting duck, basically, for this. And, and, and some of the previous speakers all, all said, you know, you can, sometimes you come into a shop and people size you up and they think, okay, this person is like that. Uh, we know those situations. We have been trained. There's, there's a level playing field. I know that if I want to pay less for a car on a Saturday uh, morning, I have not to, to dress up fancy and kind of wear my most expensive shoes. So we know, we know how to deal with that. Here we, ha we are talking about a knowledge and capabilities that are so advanced, um, drawing upon, as I said, machine learning and big data and, uh, and, and advanced behavioral science. Also, the choice modeling, um, uh, so you could line up choices for people in such a way that it would be, you know, 99% of the people would go for the, the preferred option of the seller, uh, whereas it not is uh, clearly not in their self-interest to go for that option. Um, so I, I think, yes, we, we see uh, this emerging topic of a responsibility on the side of people who who have that superior knowledge, and the end is not yet in sight, right? We, we, we are bringing in neuroscience, neuromarketing. Um, so I, I think um, that needs to be regulated, at least uh, in, to begin with, people have to be uh, pointed out, it has to be pointed out that they have a great responsibility for using, utilizing, and spreading that that information. And a little anecdote to end off with, a colleague of mine uh, who is a, an econometrist and a choice modeler uh, was so often asked for advice by the commercial sector on choice modeling and making people pick the preferred option from the point of view of the seller that he now has submitted a proposal with the ERC on the ethics of choice modeling and he got it, uh, good, good news. But so he was very, very worried about exactly the point that you, uh, that you raised. Yeah. Second brief question from you, and then we have a gentleman with glasses there, and then we're gonna round up, because we have to finish. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Professor von der Hoof, for your, uh, your answer there, and uh, you briefly touched upon my second question, actually. Um, so I'm going to try to make this as short as possible. If we, if we, uh, from a sort of philosophical point of view, uh, and bear with me, it's not my field of expertise, it's yours, obviously. If we have uh, free uh, will and free choice uh, and information uh, on this hand, and we have uh, a sort of deterministic and manipulation uh, of people uh, on, on this hand, where do you feel... Um, Lies the lies the, the the border where where we slide into uh, unethical manipulation, uh, in, in whatever uh, circumstance, be it business or political. What is what is your view on that? I I think um, and other speakers have also uh, mentioned that I think uh, like in medicine with informed consent, you know, transparency and knowledge. The the fact that that you that. The choice situation should be such that it is um, uh, that you can uh, kind of explain how things are lined up for you, what the reasons are, and if it if it um, if if your choice pattern is robust uh, with respect to that you know uh, information. I think it's th that should be okay. So transparency, information, awareness uh, of the situation in which you are choosing. Um, and the, all the, the science and knowledge that has been, uh, been, been applied there, I think is, 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 uh, is what we owe to consumers and to patients and to, and to citizens. Like in medicine, your doctor starts to operate on you and he, he needs to explain the situation to you, what the risks are, what the alternatives are, and he has to make sure that you got it, right? And if you then make a choice, 
that is, a, that is an informed choice. That is, of course, a cornerstone of data, data protection uh, regulation as well. Um, and I think it's a, it's a more general moral um, axiom that applies here as well. Gentlemen, there it is. And another question for Professor van der Hoven. Um, so we as a society, political institutions and the media are extremely slow and very reactive in finding out election interference and interference in democratic processes by basically bots, AI and micro-targeting. So we are only just now finding out what has been going on during the Brexit campaign, what has been going on during the presidential elections in the USA. So is there a way to turn the tables? Can we use the big data and artificial intelligence to try to detect and prevent election interference? Again, very good question, and I think we can, and I think we should try. Uh, as a result of our study um, uh, in conversation with a special commi commission, the Commissie Remkes in the Netherlands, that looks into the state of play in democracy in the Netherlands, we have also suggested that there that we should think about an observatory that runs in parallel with the, with the elections to see what is actually happening, as we did now, a little bit after the fact. But um, I think you can mobilize these, um, these weapons, if you want, also for, for good. Um, as we have seen also with data protection. Uh, so there is, it's not only privacy by design, uh, but it's also using big data and statistics to see whether people have been doing things that they could only have done if they had access to information that they were not allowed to access, basically. So they're, they were looking at, at these patterns. Um, and that, that, is a, that is an ex, ex post approach, and I think we could do something similar, but it Im implies that we have the capabilities in place, that we have the, we create the mechanisms and the institutions to um, to, uh, to to do that kind of work, yeah. So I, I would I would agree, and and also uh, some parties in the Netherlands have actually s uh, said that there should be a new watchdog or kind of an algorithm watchdog that uh, that not only for political purposes but also for the retail and for the commercial and the financial world should uh, should look at that because uh, again, as as we have shared here t today, uh, there's a new vulnerability and it's a, and it's a major vulnerability for citizens and it needs to be uh, uh, addressed. So, in, uh, to summarize it, your, your, your article this year was called Will Democracy Survive Big Data and Artificial Intelligence? So, Mr. van der Hoven, basically your answer to that is yes. <laughs> is that what you just said? Yes, we, yes, we can, but it's, uh, we, have to, we have to work on it. We have to really kind of uh, team up with, uh, with, uh, with the universities, with the NGOs, and, and think about, constructively think about uh, you know, what the technology can offer for democracy, and, but only if we design for it. You know, so it's not something that will happen just by itself. It now every ethical challenge is a design challenge. You really have to kind of look at the algorithms, you have to look at the infrastructure, you have to look at the, the platforms, the business models that are working there. Otherwise, you stand no chance of solving a major ethical issue. Right, uh, that concludes the Q&A session of this panel. We're